Tonight. I was diagnosed with a bicuspid heart valve. It just hit you all at once. I was running. I had been training for a half marathon. I came to a stop and then went backwards. An ABC 27 special presentation. They told me I had, uh, my heart had stopped. He wasn't experiencing anything that would have made us think that he would have had a heart attack or heart stoppage. The chances of dying are, are there. Penn State Hershey Heart and Vascular Institute presents Heart to Heart, brought to you by Penn State Milton S. Hershey Medical Center. Good evening, I'm Chuck Rhodes. American Heart Month is almost over and statistics show we are more aware of ways to keep our heart healthy. For example, in the 1960s, it was not uncommon for Americans to die of a heart attack in their 50s or 60s. Now, since 1968, the death rate from coronary heart disease has decreased. Currently, there are about 425,000 deaths each year from heart disease. Tonight, specialists from Penn State Hershey Heart and Vascular Institute are in the ABC 27 call center to answer your questions. Call the number on the bottom of the screen or you can email your questions during the show to questions at abc27.com. Dr. Ravala Maidar will answer your emails throughout tonight's show. And remember, all calls and emails are confidential. We begin tonight with Deborah Pinkerton. She'll be sharing one patient's story with you. Deborah. Thanks, Chuck. A Dolphin County man was training to run a half marathon in Hershey. His body was ready, but his heart wasn't. It's quiet now, but in a few hours, it will be anything but quiet. Teenage boys will fill up this home. We have our downtime until about 3.15 is when the first boy will start coming back in the door. Jim and Fran Smith are house parents at the Milton Hershey School. We basically fill the role as parents while they're living here at Milton Hershey School. We're constantly trying to help them in, in ways that are going to take them to a different level than maybe when they got here. 16-year-old Randy Gibson has already reached a different level. Hey, bud. How you doing? Pretty good. He doesn't live with the Smiths, but he was with Jim last September. I have to tell you what I was told because I have no memory whatsoever. Randy helps put the pieces together. He takes us to Red Oak Lane where Randy did something most of us will never do. He saved a life, Jim's. I had been training for a half marathon, the Hershey Half and I was running with a running club that we have for the kids, the Couch to 5K program. Basically, you get them off the couch and, and running. A buddy of mine said, I, I told him I wasn't feeling well and I was gonna take a break. He said, I stopped to talk to you guys. Uh, what, what was I saying? Uh, you just came up and like running and you created us like, how are you guys, like how are you doing, like how's your day, and just like basic stuff like that, like when you saw our conversation. Uh -huh. And then I just keeled right over and... Like, yeah, you just fell over. At the time, I didn't completely realize that you were like sort of like unconscious. I thought like you were pulling a prank or like just like resting in some odd way. Randy quickly realized Jim wasn't pulling a prank and he reacted. He put into action a skill he learned as a 10th grader, CPR. You're still breathing really heavily. And then I wasn't sure if I should have started because like, you're still breathing. But then it became less and less. And I'm like, oh my gosh, should I start by now? Because like, I don't want to die. So I just like start CPR. Others came to relieve Randy before the ambulance arrived. I was working on dinner. And in the middle of that preparation, I had a phone call um, that I needed to get to um, the Hershey Med Center that Jim had um, collapsed. He sustained a cardiac arrest, so his heart went into an unstable rhythm, wasn't able to continue perfusing enough blood to his brain um, to keep him conscious, and he passed out. I'm shocked, <laughs> kind of surprised. We had just come back from a week of vacation, and he had been running eight and 10 miles. He didn't have any symptoms of anything. So they did a cardiac catheterization, which is where they insert a catheter up into the heart, and, uh, up into the aorta, and inject dye directly down to the coronary arteries so that you can see if there are any potential blockages. 
And what we see is the catheter coming down into the left main, which is the, the largest vessel feeding the heart. That splits into two vessels that feed the left ventricle. And you can see here at the end of the left main and the beginning of those two branches, there's a serious narrowing. That was the serious blockage area for Jim. It was kind of mind-numbing, um, but I think that we always had that kind of in our, in our thinking just because of the history of his family. Uh, my sister's had stents put in. She had a heart attack eight years ago. She's younger than I am. My father's had open heart surgery twice. My mom had open heart surgery. Both of my grandfathers passed away with a heart event. Bypass surgery was the only solution. Everything made perfect sense. And, you know, just a matter of getting your emotions and your mind around all of that when it's totally taken you by surprise um, was a lot. I was aware enough to know that this was necessary. Um, I trusted what they were telling me. Uh, and just, I wanted it done just to get it over with, I guess, at that point. In Jim's case, we rerouted the blood flow around uh, his blockage in his distal left main using an artery that runs on the underside of his chest and a piece of vein from his leg uh, to supply the two main arteries that were affected by the blockage. And this helped uh, get new fresh blood flow past uh, that, to an area of his heart which was not receiving enough adequate blood flow. Jim was in surgery for about four hours. The one person who couldn't wait to see how he was doing was Randy. It was just like, it just lit to my heart like that he was like, okay, and like breathing and yeah. I think I just started to cry. I said thanks as best I could and teared up doing it now. I was just so glad like it was okay. I was just like so happy that he was, he was okay and he was going to make a full recovery. Just like so happy. I just said I couldn't thank you enough. Um, you know, you, ha you helped you help give my husband back. Um, you, you kept on going until you know, the professionals could get there. Um, you, didn't, you didn't hesitate. You didn't think, well, I don't want to or I, or I shouldn't. I mean, you just, you just did. So I think Randy, without exaggerating, um, saved his life um, and allowed emergency responders to get there, allowed him to be stable and get the care that he needed here in the hospital. Three months after the cardiac arrest, Jim and Fran were back at work preparing meals for the teens. I feel great. I've started running again. I'm, you know, I actually do think I have more energy, more bounce. R really good. I was just like, he's okay. He's walking. Yay! It did something good. Awesome. Jim and Fran hope these teenage boys learn some valuable lessons from this life-changing experience. I hope that they realize that life is precious. Life is a gift. I want them to take something away from here that I can't give them anymore. And my faith is the thing that I, I want them to see as the most vital, the most important facet of my recovery. Jim mentioned he is running again and plans to do the Hershey Half Marathon in October. Now, Randy's efforts did not go unnoticed. The American Heart Association gave him the Heart Saver Hero Award for helping save Jim's life. Chuck, back to you. Thank you, Deborah. An award well deserved there. Now, joining us in the studio, Dr. Michael Pfeiffer. Uh, doctor, some of our viewers see that story. They see a man training for a half marathon. <laughs> obviously takes good care of himself, and yet he has a heart problem. Is that discouraging to somebody watching? Should they be concerned about that? Well, it, it could be, and I would tell them honestly that uh, unfortunately we can't prevent all cardiovascular disease. We can reduce risk, however, and I think the takeaway message from Jim's story should be that his healthy habits um, uh, really helped him to survive his event and to recover well, um, so those things are still meaningful. Now, in the story, you mentioned that Randy's quick action saved his life. Talk about that. 
from the CPR, I remember from the Boy Scouts and the Navy, and as a volunteer firefighter, it has changed. Talk yeah. about that. The American Heart Association has uh, recently emphasized a hands-only approach to CPR. Um, so they, they suggest that you call 911, get a defibrillator if one's available, and then start chest compressions hard and fast in the center of the chest, about 100 beats a minute. Uh, there's information for this that's available uh, through the AHA and, and on Hershey's website. Now, family history, that played a big part, obviously, when he mentioned his sister and his parents mm -hmm. and so on, and his grandparents. Uh, how important is that for us to know the family history and with whom do we share that? Yeah, I mean some some risk factors for heart disease are modifiable. We can do things to make them better. Family history is one that's not modifiable. Um, so being aware of it allows you to notify your physicians if you have relatives who had heart disease at a young age or close relatives, letting your physician know about that then can help to assess your risk and, and try to reduce it as much as possible. Keep everybody posted. Correct. Thank you, Doctor, for joining us here tonight, and we're going to check back in right now with Deborah in the ABC 27 call center. Deborah, they're busy over there. You are right, Chuck. They are busy. You can see right here, this is where you can call. You have the number to call is 717-346-3333. The specialists are here ready to answer your questions about heart disease. Now, here to answer some of our viewer questions this evening is cardiologist Dr. Edward Langford. Thanks for being here. This is our first viewer question. I'm a 55-year-old female with a family history of heart disease on my father's side. I've been diagnosed with stage 2 high blood pressure but due to the costs and side effects, I'm unable to take any other medications. What other options do I have? Well, first thing to note is that with high blood pressure, that decreasing sodium intake and exercise almost always help decrease blood pressure. The other thing is, is that there are 12 different classes of medications to control blood pressure, and often one medication alone doesn't get the job done, so it may take a low dose of two or three medications. But of those, there are still many that are $10 for three months uh, with no insurance, so they can be very inexpensive. And so I would strongly encourage you to work with your physician to come up with a medication that is uh, going to work for you and not cause side effects. So work with your physician on that. Okay, great. Thank you so much. A Lancaster County man learned he had a heart defect when he was in his 40s. As you will see, it has not stopped him from living his life to the fullest. Anybody can take a picture but a photographer is the person that can capture the moment for what it truly was. And that's what I, I attempt to do. 59-year-old Bill Hunking seems to capture the moment well. I bought my very first camera as a senior in high school, and it just was something I've always loved doing. Bill's been taking heartfelt pictures ever since, even when he found out he had some heart issues of his own. Bill learned he had a heart defect when he was 48 years old. My doctor kept saying about a heart murmur, which I never had any clue as to why he would be saying that. And they had me tested and it came back and told me I had a bicuspid heart valve. I didn't know a whole lot about it, so I just was, you know, concerned. My biggest uh, reaction was, what does it mean? What, what changes will happen in my life? He had um, what's called a bicuspid aortic valve, which is a, it's a congenital abnormality, meaning you're born with it. Instead of having three cusps or three leaflets which open and close to prevent the blood from going back into the heart and basically make it go one way, he had a fusion of two of the leaflets, the left and the right, which were, which were stuck together, fused at birth, uh, which prevented the blood from exiting the heart normally. Surgery would be needed in the future, but not now. So Bill remained active, snapping pictures and playing ice hockey. He just needed to see a cardiologist every year. And it was on one of those visits several years later, doctors became suspicious with Bill's symptoms. Sometimes it feels like I'm swallowing something right here. That caught his attention real quick. We had to do repeat catheterization. It had been so long, and we found that he developed more coronary artery disease. And after the catheterization, they said, uh, we're doing emergency bypass tomorrow. Here you see a blockage of about 80% of his left main coronary artery, where the catheter is injecting dye into the coronary arteries. It throws you for a loop. I mean, you, you, you have the fear of, oh my goodness, they're going to open you up and, and do this to you. You know, the chances 
of dying are there. The uncertainty, the not knowing what, what you're going through, it just hits you all at once. It was a good thing to have uh, family there. It was nerve wracking, but you know, it's also a time to, to reflect and gather information, and take it together as a family, and try to learn from it. You know, we were all pretty nervous, but we had good support, you know, people there with us and praying and everything like that. He had two bypass grafts placed, one on the LED, which is the artery on the front of the heart, one on the circumflex branch, which is on the side of the heart. Uh, these two bypass grafts took care of the heart muscle that was in jeopardy from that blockage. It's just a hiccup. That's the best way I like to call it. It's, you know, an inconvenience at the time, but, you know, you feel better. Another inconvenience came after another visit with the cardiologist last year. This time, it was his bicuspid aortic valve. He said, you know, it looks like we're going to have to start doing something here real soon. And I was thinking, you know, well, okay, maybe next year or the following year. And um, he said that I think we're going to do a stress test to, just to confirm it. The second time through, you could see on the echocardiogram that the degree of obstruction had become severe. The valve is like rock now. All this brightness here is fibrotic calcified tissue. These valve leaflets are very stiff. They hardly move. And because they don't open, they restrict flow severely. The valve abnormality that he had prevented the blood from exiting his heart. That progressively got worse over time. And as part of his workup for that, he uh, was noted to have another blockage in one of the other arteries in his heart. He informed me, oh, this is the situation. They, they want to do the catheterization, and uh, they also expect that they're, they're, they want to replace the, the valve um, urgently. Bill's son and his family, who were working abroad in Europe, came home for the surgery. Josh gave me a big hug, and I, I remember going in, and, and um, uh, they said, OK, we're ready. It's never easy, and uh, you know I remember being there with them as they're preparing him, and you know seeing the, the nervousness and the fear, you know, in his eyes. The only time that I really got anxious about it is like when I would think like, what if something goes wrong during the surgery, you know, and then I would start, you know, the worrying thing. What we did here was opened up above this aortic valve, cut these leaflets out, removed all this calcium, debrided the area so that it was soft and pliable, and then we sewed the new valve into that place right there. As part of his aortic valve replacement, we did a bypass graft to these arteries on the bottom of his heart as well. Bill woke up with his family by his side. The grandkids make it uh, a thrill, and not to have the surgery, but you come out and, you know, how are you doing? Little Mia, would she'd come up and make me drink something. She'd make me do the breathing exercises and, and uh, she'd take my temperature. Little girls who gave their papa so much inspiration. Four weeks after the surgery, Bill was active again. He photographed a wedding. I look forward to each day. I don't dwell on things I can't change. This is the condition God has given me. I will make the most of it. Uh, I just feel blessed. As you saw on this piece, Bill is playing ice hockey again, and when the weather gets warmer, he'll be riding his bike too. Chuck? And I also couldn't help noticing how good those photographs are that he does there. Well, thank you. And joining us now on the set is Dr. Edward Stevenson. And Dr. We saw you in the report talking about this, but what type of valve did he have put in and what were his options? Uh, he had a, what's called a pericardial tissue valve put in, which is made from the outside lining of a cow's heart. Uh, there are two options for valve replacement. One is a tissue valve, either made of his pericardium or a uh, pig heart valve, or there are mechanical valves, which are made of, of metal and plastic that are an option as well. What's the difference between tissue and mechanical valve? The, the big difference is, is the way the valves are constructed and there are some advantages and disadvantages to both valves. The advantage to the mechanical valve being made of medical, metal and plastic is it lasts forever and it doesn't need to be replaced very often. 
the downside, however, is that you need to be on a blood thinner uh, forever for the rest of your life. The advantage of the tissue valve is that you don't need to be on this blood thinner, but the downside is, is that it only lasts around 10 or 15 years, so a reoperation or replacing this valve may be necessary in the future. Okay, well, thank you, doctor, for joining us here tonight. We appreciate that very much. And let's go back now to the ABC 27 call center to Deborah. Deborah. Thanks, Chuck. Here is our next viewer question. Dr. Langford is here to answer that. I'm a 42-year-old female, overweight but healthy otherwise. During the day, I get very fatigued, and when I've checked my heart rate, it's in the low 40s. Should I be concerned? Well, I think if you're not an athlete, having a heart rate that's resting and in the 40s is probably not normal. This can be evaluated fairly easily. An EKG could be done, and also you could walk around and see if your heart rate rises. And if either of those is not looking normal, then that should be further pursued. It could be done pretty quickly and easily, though. Okay, thank you so much. I had coronary bypass in 2006, and I felt good until the past year. I've had severe heartburn in the early morning hours, and I've had lack of energy and ambition. My doctor said my recent stress echo test was borderline and prescribed Renexa. Do you think I should go for further testing? Well, it isn't clear from that question whether or not the heartburn could be from the heart or not. It isn't always true that a borderline abnormal stress test needs further changes in therapy, but it is, if this Renexa is perhaps causing symptoms, that should be pursued with your physician. So I think this person should be discussing this with their physician, and if it didn't make any difference with symptoms, uh, perhaps consider stopping it. Um, Renexa is a medication that is used sort of as a last-ditch effort. It is a last resort, and so if it's not making a difference, then it probably shouldn't be continued. Okay, here's our last viewer question. My mother has heart failure, and I read online about a new drug called LCZ-696. It's due to come out this year. Can you tell us what is different about this medication? Well, this medication is not yet approved in the United States or Europe either yet, but it's a combination medication. So the same pill contains two different medications, one of which is a medication that we've been using now for quite a few years to treat heart failure or high blood pressure. And it also includes another medication that inhibits an enzyme that affects the blood vessels, the heart, and the kidneys. And this medication did look rather promising in a trial that ended about last year. Uh, but there are some concerns about that study, so we have to wait to see whether or not it proves to be as good as it first looked. Okay, Dr. Langford, thanks so much for answering our questions tonight. And we us now on the set is Dr. Mark Kozak, an interventional cardiologist. And doctor, in the last segment, we talked about different types of valve replacements. What options do patients have if they're older or considered high risk what, to open heart surgery? What are their options? That's a great question because in the past, these people were not considered candidates for traditional valve replacement and they simply had to live with the consequences of having a bad valve. Uh, now we have a, a new option for these patients and you can see it's a catheter mounted valve that we would place uh, with a, a balloon and that would inflate the, the valve uh, in the position on the inside of the model of the heart like this. So, so this is an attractive option for these folks who are, who are older and maybe sicker. Is this an option for everyone, this procedure? Well, this, is, this has been available for about five years, and the durability of these valves is not known. A traditional surgically replaced valve might last 10, 15, 20 years or longer, and we don't know how long these are going to last. And so, therefore, somebody who is younger and has a, a, a long life expectancy, uh, we would not recommend that they have this done. And talk about recovery time from this procedure. Well, that's another uh, bonus of this particular treatment modality is since the incisions are very small, the recovery time is very fast, and it's, it's common for these people to, to leave the hospital and literally walk out of the hospital within two days. All right. Well, thank you, doctor, for joining us here tonight and bringing the props along here to clarify a few things. And we also want to thank you, our viewers, for sharing your stories and sending in your questions. And if you would like more information or you'd like to maybe schedule an appointment with Penn State Hershey Heart and Vascular Institute, all you do is call 531-4554 or you can visit online at pennstatehershey.org slash heart and vascular. Now, Monday